get started and just real quickly, so the seat has been contracted really just to determine the status, what does it look like in our county um, in terms of you know the needs, opportunities, and uh, some of the challenges and things like that. And so we're doing some research, um, local, state, federal, um, in terms of agencies that fund, currently uh, support childcare. But then we're also going to be doing some surveys, which we'll be getting out to the business community and uh, individuals. And so anybody that's here or that views this video link, we're going to ask your help to get these surveys out so that we can get a, a good picture of what's going on with, with Walworth County. We're also going to kind of do a little bit of a compilation of some best practices that we're finding in our research and then ultimately try to suggest some forms of assistance. I think you heard, if you were here earlier, heard the administrator say they've had some challenges with some of the funding that they received, the federal funding, in terms of how they're able to spend it. Um, he's hoping they'll be able to, but if not, he's hoping that this um, survey that we're doing in this study will help with uh, us or the county being able to actually bring in some more grant funding so, so that's all I wanted to touch on with, with the piece that I'm doing. Again, our pr uh, presenters today, John Zinzow with uh, Benefit Concepts. He's based in uh, Whitewater here. John has, I've known him for the whole time I've been on with WSEDA. He was on our WSEDA board, continues to be on as a committee member and uh, working on a lot of different um, things in the community around health and other issues uh, related to, to workforce. So really happy to have you here, John, and working with us on, on uh, the study. Again, Tammy and Debbie uh, from Lakeland's Little Learners. So really happy to have them with us. And I think I'll ask John to come up first and just um, kind of lay out some, some of the research that we're doing. So. Well, thank you, Derek. Can you all hear me? Well, if, if you could use this, John, it might be better just for the videotaping. Well, yeah. Hang on, hang on. Yeah. And then, we'll just spill my water. Well, good morning. You know, the first uh, question I'd like to ask you folks is, uh, how many of you are here uh, with HR as a background? And how many of you are here someone who has an interest in seeking child care for a child care. Okay. Um, well, thank you very much. That helps. Because I <clears throat> want to try to be to the point and uh, take you through this. So it's kind of hard for me to see it. Well, I'm trying to be here on this one. So, um, what we're going to do first is take you through the process that we use to get to what is the problem and what we're looking for while we define the problem is ideas for potential solutions because that's what we're all looking for. So um, there's also organizations that we talk to and I'm really so impressed with uh, Wisconsin and Walworth County where they really have people who are committed to helping with the child care dilemma. Because it's indeed a complex thing to fix. Families, because I'm sure most of you are aware of a 
they stepped up and got the money to both group and uh, home-based child care. So this is the funding that took place in 2020 when things started to unravel. Of course, they already had been unraveling. The center's closing because of the virus. And you can see the kind of dollars there, $4 billion here. And 2020 in December, they put in another $10 billion. Then $39 billion in the American Re uh, Rescue Plan Act. And that was subsequent to the Build Back Better initiative that failed to um, progress. So, and this is something that economists talk about a lot, is opportunity costs. And what this means is business lost $16 billion to the U.S. taxpayer. So this is all macro stuff, which is the kind of information that I like to share with company owners because somebody has obviously got a background in business and economics. And that money would have been there and generated in the economy had the employers been able to actually bring their employees on, but because of child care problems, they couldn't. So this is something that collectively we've got to work on, is get these employers to understand that they got to come to the table and help, and we all do. So there's a summary, quick summary of the workforce changes. You can see how we lost so many people out of the workforce, and that's turnover and retention on the left. So again, this is kind of at the macroeconomic level of what's going on in the workforce. And of course, this is something that even back in the 90s, I said to myself, how can these people, highly educated as they are, with good degrees, and they can't get compensated? Ridiculous. And this is uh, kind of a number of, another view of things where there's something that they discuss a lot, which is cost burden. And this is uh, supposedly the relationship that exists between the cost of childcare and household income. And the one on the right is actually uh, shows the degree of subsidy. Because employers ask me, well, how much is the child care being subsidized? Well, this is one way to look at it for those people who are getting actual reimbursement from the state. And this is something that is also important for all of us to understand is child care really exceeds many of the other household expense items. It's a big ticket cost. So there has to be support and help. And this is another way to look at um, child care costs or burden. That's as a percent of household income. In the right, you can see how these are different things that educators indicated why they were leaving their industry, you know, their profession. <clears throat> and these are uh, other statistics. And for any of you who would like this research, I will get it to you. So this is kind of the end of my uh, presentation, so I'm going to let the ladies take over. And this is getting more into what 
we can do to solve this problem? I have been running the center since it opened um, back in 1985. Um, we were located at Lakeland Nursing Home to begin with. Uh, some of the parents are even here, correct? Hi. <laughs> um, and then we did build the new center with a lot of Johns Hopkins study that John found and it was very interesting and had a lot of the info so we thought we would just go through it on uh, early care and education in Wisconsin specifically and the challenges that we face. Okay. Um, high quality, affordable, early care and education uh, promotes children's development, parents' employment, the U.S. economy. We've always been told it lowers uh, incarceration, incarceration rates uh, later on. Um, go ahead. Speak up anytime. <laughs> <laughs> well, just to, that if they take a look at a correlation of children who actually participated in a high quality early childhood experience versus a less or nil quality experience. Um, at one point, when we were doing research for building our center, they actually found a one to seventeen dollar correlation in extra expense to taxpayers later in life because they weren't taught healthy habits and or they weren't given a structure that kept them out of jail. Which is why it helps the USA gun. Yeah. Okay. Um, early care and education, there are, there are different types, obviously, center based as we are. There's family child care, and then there's individual, like, non relative people that come in to care for you, especially during the summer. Uh, care for your children or else relatives. Um, all can be wonderful, absolutely. I, it, to begin with, infants and toddlers are the lower lower amount, lower percentage of children in child care. As they get older, there are more, more and more children. Well, we can take more and more children as well. But I think people feel more comfortable with relatives or somebody or individual care with the infants and toddlers as well. So. But as John mentioned, it is a large budget, budget item. And I mean, Chris and I were talking earlier too. I mean, it's more than putting your child through college. It, it is very, very expensive. Um, that's why we can't afford to, to tax the parents anymore because they're paying so much in the first place. Um, but had we not had the PPP loans over the last couple of years, as well as the grants that have come through the CARES Act that John was talking about and DCF and so on, there is no way we'd be in this position. Some people who didn't, weren't able to take advantage of some of those have closed. A lot of centers have closed, unfortunately. And a lot of family care centers have closed as well. So the amount of childcare that's out there is not enough. And partially that has to do with the fact that we can't find enough teachers, unfortunately. Several aren't going into it because, as that other study said, um, low wages and so on. We have increased our wages significantly. That's still not terrific compared to a lot of places. We're probably you know, starting people the same rate as McDonald's or you know, some of the other places because they've all had to increase as well, unfortunately. Um, in today's society. So there are less and less people going into it, but people who have stuck with it because they were in it for the right reasons to begin with are, are still there, but they're getting older and going to be retiring soon. So we need fresh blood. You know, we get a couple once in a while, but, but not a lot, unfortunately. Access to early childhood education in Wisconsin, I believe this says, although it's very tiny and, and small, but it shows like in Walworth County area that I think it's like a one to five, you know, that there are, there's one spot available for every five children that need it, unfortunately, right now in Walworth County and a lot of the state, as you can see the red and orange dots indicate that. Changes in license, early child care, education, and this study only goes through 2019. I'm sure you would see much larger, you can see that it declined, unfortunately, and it has declined more because there are centers that we know of that have closed in the last couple of years because of COVID and because of, I mean, there was a lack of children because of parents working from home, because uh, one or more of the parents decided to stay home. Um, Unemployment was good for a little while, and so you know that helped them to be able to do that. People found they were able to work from home and stay at home, and so on. It has gotten back, so now people want to be able to get back into childcare because they want to go back to their workplaces, or they find that they're not getting enough done when they're at home with their children. Um, but unfortunately, I mean, we could we could hire at least three more teachers for sure, which would give us probably another 30, 40 spots for children but we don't have the people applying for the positions. So that makes it tough. 
and several of um, I take request calls for spots and availability and I would say even over the last six months there's been a drastic increase of need because the center they're at is closing or the center they're at is downsizing because they can't find staff so they're telling people you need to we're going to shrink our numbers to the staff we have you need to go someplace else and we can't help all of them we try <laughs> The, the chart on the left essentially is just showing the family child care providers and how it has decreased over the years. The one on the right is licensed child care providers, again, kind of showing how things have decreased. The need has increased and the, the uh, centers have decreased. And again, that only goes through, I believe, 2019. Yeah, 2019. Um, so I think you would see that it would keep declining if, you, if we had the last two years data as well. Um, explanations for these trends, we're working on it. <laughs> Several factors uh, may be at play, the aging population that I talked about, the, the teachers that are getting older and going to be retiring and, um, or have retired recently, and so that's partially why people, even in the school districts, you can see that they have so many openings now that they didn't have before. Increase in cost and burden of providing care, the decline in value of subsidy reimbursement rates and low wages, um, a lot of the parents that were receiving subsidies, several of them aren't receiving subsidy anymore. So, unfortunately, that makes it very tough for them to continue. Low wages, limited benefits, absolutely, um, on both hands. I mean, if there's low wages in the area in Walworth County, it makes it tough to pay for child care. If we can only afford to pay lower wages, it makes it tough. And again, we probably pay the best in Walworth County. Well, I don't know about Roseman Center here on campus, but other than that, we probably pay the best in Walworth County um, and comparable with the rest of the state, definitely. We try to try to keep it up there as, as best we can. We have to hire, we provide for pay for the Elkhorn School District, and so we have to hire DPI licensed teachers. We're a five-star rated center, and so we have to hire, we have to have degree people in all of the classrooms. So we have to pay a little bit better, but with the increase in wages over the last couple of years that we had to do just to get people through the doors, if we hadn't had all this funding that we've had recently, and it is set to expire in July, I don't know what we would do. I'm, I'm hoping, obviously, that funding will continue or that something else will come up or these wonderful gentlemen will come up with something. <laughs> um, but right now, things are tough all over, I know. Uh, it's just in order to keep childcare going, we need money, unfortunately. I also think that from when I started in early childhood and now, and really the respect for what this job takes, I believe has increased, not totally there, we still have people that consider us a babysitting service, um, which is very offensive to our staff, who tried to put in a lot of education, but there was an emphasis for this to become your profession, your lifelong learning profession that you progress with. As to when I started, most people that I ran into, they were there as a second income piece to their family. They didn't need the health insurance. They didn't need the backup for life insurance. They didn't need all the benefits we offer. That those people coming into us younger, looking at as their lifelong career are needing. So the cost or the burden as it was in the previous slide of providing for staffing is increased because as a profession, people are looking at it to supply more of their budget needs for their family. And this slide is just talking about why people are leaving the early childhood field along with it being low paying. It's a tough job. It really is a tough job. More and more, the children that are coming to us because the others find cheaper alternative care someplace else are the, the children that are need extra care that may be difficult, that you know have maybe been kicked out of other places and so on. And so it's a tough job and you, you get hit, it, you get you know, all sorts of things along with it, but the more educated teachers we have, the better because they're more prepared for some of these things, but some of the things they're just not prepared for at all. So there are more people, unfortunately, leaving the field, and some that are very good. Some it is for money, definitely. Others it is just because it's such a tough job. Why are early childhood, should early childhood education workers' wages so low if care is unaffordable for families. It, I mean, for example, in the infant toddler area, you can have one staff person for four children. 
and the four children bring in, I forget what it was, but we charge five eighty-five per hour. So if you have four children there, which you don't always have, sometimes you only have three children, or sometimes two children, sometimes you have six, but you have to have two staff, and so on and so forth. That does not even pay the wages and benefits for that staff person, let alone go towards anything for the building or the utilities or the supplies or any of the food, things like that. Um, the older children make up for the infants and toddlers. That's why you can't take as many infants and toddlers, unfortunately, because you can take so many older children compared to the staff. So you do make more money with the older children. Um, but again, fees don't pay for all of it. We have to look for and constantly scrambling for grants for um, anything that we can come up with to be able to, you know, fundraisers and so on. That's why it's like I used to teach at a Catholic school and then I went to this and I've been fundraising my whole life. So <laughs> it just doesn't cover it. Yeah, fundraising is always, even before COVID, needed to be a part of our operating budget. We counted on fundraising and our families helping us fundraise um, where 501c3 is as part of just the operating budget for the center, not extra gravy. So I think we kind of went over all of the challenges that there are out there. Um, the geographic proximity to early childhood varies widely across communities, uh, but access tends to be better in more urban areas. There's just more centers in the cities than there are out in the, I mean, up north, it's really, really tough for some of the people, and it is tough for the centers to make do too, which is why several of them have closed. Um, it's been stable over time, but the number of family child care providers have decreased as well. Again, some of them may be just getting older and then decided to, to go out of the business, and others, younger people, aren't tending to open family child care centers. Um, some just because of money, and others just it's not the thing to do anymore, I guess. Um, early childhood workforce is experienced, educated, and committed to the profession, but experiences low compensation and challenging work conditions. That's the biggest thing right there. They are. They're as educated as the teachers in the school districts. They're as educated as many of the jobs out in the market. It's just that they don't get paid what they're worth, unfortunately. And turnover then becomes a big thing. Financial incentives reduce teacher turnover. Um, oh, this is a, a study that they shows what they did in Virginia, but Wisconsin does similar things, like what I was talking about with the CARES grants and um, with DCF trying to come through, or even the PPP loans. I mean, all of that has helped extremely, and it has kept us afloat, absolutely, and, and the other centers that are open. I'm sure it's because of that. And we even used it all appropriately. <laughs> Raising awareness of existing programs. Um, it's again just talking about family child care centers and um, and us, the group centers, and what you can take advantage of. So they, the state is trying to incentivize the the program by offering what's called reward, which is uh, money offered to teachers who stay in the profession, and it's based on their education level and, and the centers that they're working at and how long they've worked there and so on. So we keep encouraging them to do that. The teach scholarships are something where the center will pay a portion and then this teach scholarship will pay the other portion so that teachers will go back to school and continue their education and, and or kids coming right out of high school can take advantage of that and work at the same time while they're, they're doing their education, which does help, absolutely. People are, the, the government right now is really trying to help in the state of Wisconsin, which has been wonderful. And centers that, that can try to help as well. For example, we will bring on someone who looks like they have great potential to start working with us. We will also pay for some of their introductory classes if they agree to stay with us complete them successfully and be with us for at least a year. Um, not every, I don't think not every center can afford to do that, and I don't know how many we can afford to do a year. We have a limit, but it's not like we're expecting everybody else to solve all the problems. We do try to do what we can to bring our workforce where we want it as well. So there are contributing factors to varying abilities by varying centers. And some of the grants, I know I mentioned that it helped keep staff and help keep the center afloat, but some of the grants that we've had, I have used to help parents as well. Um, some of the parents that are struggling, some of the parents that receive subsidy, but it just wasn't enough through all of this and so on. And so we use the money to pay off their bills. 
um, so that they could keep coming and then hopefully keep working and then eventually get back on their feet and so on. And it has helped, definitely. How long it will continue, I just don't know, is a big thing. That's the hard part. Easing the burdens, this is talking about family child care providers, but it, it goes for everybody. Um, just recognizing the strengths that you know, what we do provide, trying to ease the administrative burdens, uh, facilitating peer support networks and help navigating early childhood systems. Um, Derek had talked yesterday a little bit about, yeah, if we could get involved with the uh, high schools and, and, um, and I think you do it, they mentioned in manufacturing as well, but if they have early childhood teachers in high schools and they teach child development and child development too and so on and so forth, but in many cases like in Elkhorn, for example, those teachers aren't certified so they come out of high school with having taken those courses and they have to retake them at Gateway or Whitewater or someplace else. Some schools do have certified teachers, but if some monies can go towards making sure that those teachers are certified, we can get those kids right out of high school. And even if they don't stay in early childhood, it would give them a job to help work through college while they are you know, doing whatever it is they want to pursue. And thank you. Um, I don't know if it's a good time for questions and answers or if you have to yeah, yeah, I'll take it from here. So, you know, I think just uh, following up on your last point there too, and I'm glad Chris, um, Chris is here I'm trying to hear. But, you know, we think through. Okay, gosh, it is a problem. We look at the costs, and you know, what are we going to do? And it looks like it's going to get more challenging going forward. And so, yeah, you know, we're trying to think different things we can do, but. Um, Obviously, you know, they, they want to continue to, to work with grant funding, um, but can we work with the local employers to talk about, hey, this is, just let them know what the situation is, because I think when I talk sometimes with people, they'll say, well, you know, just let the market do its thing. Well, obviously the market isn't doing its thing it's in terms of, you know, being able to pay, um, you know, wages that retain good teachers and that, and so, you know, they're, we're going to have to figure out some incentives and really connect um, people that are utilizing those really well. And so if employers are looking for people who are not going to work because they don't have child care, you know, maybe that's a way where we can plug in as well. But uh, the reason I mentioned to Chris at the high schools and with Gateway is because, you know, uh, and, and it's not just Gateway, I think other schools that are around the state are, are doing that as well, but, you know, doing dual credits and things like that. And so, you know, are there ways that we can help connect where, you know, we were talking where, you know, they have a, a high school student that's working, that's getting credits, maybe their staff at the center is, you know, trained by Gateway to be able to do some credits so that they're not having to finish and then go back and get more, you know, so are there ways that we can work with, with Gateway, with UW, with the high schools, you know, to help that situation where everybody benefits? Of, of course, with the kids, you know, they're getting real life experience, so, so that's great too. So, you know, I think what we're hoping that we do out of this survey, and I appreciate Tammy's also been involved in giving us input on the survey um, or the study that we're doing that will include surveys, but for the, the county, but I think what we're hoping is to be able to give them some ideas and say, here are some things that can be done. Maybe it's education programs, and you help fund that for the local community, for the you know all, all the different stakeholders. You know, is it ways to just look at things a little bit differently and help, or is it you know funding a grant person? You know, I know that there's some of the communities that are have some grant people, and so this is a, a really good agency to, to help support in that regard, but really just trying to talk about it, talk about the issues so everybody understands what the challenges are, and then you know, we'll, we'll continue to look at, at different ways that uh, potentially could help, but I don't think there's any one solution out there, silver bullet, you can't, I don't think we found or you have, uh, you know, oh, this community is doing it this way. If we could just do it that way, then we'd solve all the problems. Um, uh, so, you know, it, it's a super important issue, and um, you know, we're going to continue to to work with it. But, and does anybody? I just want to open it up. Do we have some questions here for the for the? Two uh, questions. When, how, how will we come upon that study, or how we can do it? 
how do you get the information? Yeah, we'll definitely we'll share you know what we have here. I know John in some of his research had um, found this um, study that that they reviewed right now that that. Um, so you Debbie. <coughs> Well, no, ours isn't quite done yet, but we will get that, and then you know some of this material. Be, I think what John liked about this is it was just done in April. Uh, UW with, through the institute, of, they cut, you know really took a, a close look at that. Um, but some of the data, as you mentioned, was you know as current as they could get was 2019. We're hoping within the next month or whatever to be able to you know share that with the okay. county and then get that out there. But, you can email. Uh, just send me an email at john at bevtheconcepts.us and uh, I can, I'll, then what I will do is respond to the information that we've assembled so far and you know if you'd like to get started and looking so much you can. And what is your weight? Like what, how many people are being denied? Not denied, it's not space. Right, right. And it, Debbie actually handles the waiting list, so I'll, I'll refer her to that question. But. I don't have an exact number um, because we stopped keeping a formal waiting list. Their demand was just too great, um, and the list was, was daunting to keep the day and time of this is the next person that gets it. We would sometimes find ourselves possibly working for someone who gave us a name, but then they moved or their shift changed or, or something like that, and it, and it was taking away time from others but mostly because the sheer need and the number of calls we get, it's, it's we just fill them as soon as we can with whatever call comes in next. Um, over, I would say, if you want to just average over a course of a day, I can probably get four or five calls on an infant toddler. Um, recently, as people are discovering, they forgot to arrange for their school agers. In the, the last week, I've gotten several who forgot to accommodate their school agers and our school agers are basically full um, unless somebody changes their mind and then I'll fill, fill them in. But I would I would say if I could have filled everybody along the way, I probably have a good 60 or 70 that want infant toddler care that are gonna be two years old before we can probably get there. And if we had, for example, we could fill another teacher's worth of school agers this summer, absolutely, but I don't have another teacher unfortunately, to put in there. Um, Three-year-olds, I think we could probably do the same thing. It, the age levels just kind of vary all the time. And infant toddlers, we don't have the space. We build every bit of space that we can for the infant toddlers that we have, and there just is no more space for them. So. Some of our current families are waiting for more days to open up. They started with some because they had the liberty to do that and then pick them up, but they wanted full time when they, they asked. So um, three-year-olds, um, we are starting to fill for fall. I probably have infant toddler spots not even available into 2023 unless people change what they need. Um, and I get that from other centers when people call, they'll say, oh, they tell me there's a waiting list, but it's gonna be two years. Or, you know, so they were, we were, they were hoping we had something sooner. And we might, because some people's needs are different than others, you sort of puzzle piece them together but the need is far exceeding space availability. I think about the only place we have a little bit of room right now is our two-year-olds, and that only switched over on June 13th when we could move up some of our threes. So for example, we have about 150 children at a time at the center, but only 16 of those are children under the age of two. So it's a very limited amount of spots, unfortunately. And we used to be able to take more, but we can't now teacher-wise, we have to say the older kids to take the younger kids. You know, I just, as we're talking, you know, because obviously there's the wages and what you can pay is, is a, definitely a, a challenge uh, for you to be able to recruit and retain. But can you just talk a little bit, too, about what the, you know, credentials are that you need, you know, to be, to work in your facility? Sure. So an assistant teacher just needs those two courses that they could get in high school if they could, you know, get them in high school. Um, but we have to have a lead teacher that does have some sort of certification. So they have to have either an associate's degree or a bachelor's degree or greater than that. The DPI licensed teachers do have to have bachelor's degree and those are the only ones we can have for 4K. Um, but the other teachers can be led by someone who has an associate's degree in early childhood education. 
that's generally a two-year program, and the bachelor's program is generally for people do it in different amounts of times, but um, generally that's what it takes. But again, those assistant teachers only need the couple of courses to begin with, and that kind of then would allow them to get their feet wet in the, the field and see if it's something they like, and then they can continue their education from there and decide if they want to go ahead and get their degrees to be able to do that. Any other questions? Sure, Jen, I think he just wants to share a few more comments well, here. I wanted to just kind of go forward, you know, give them some ideas of sure. how we're going to get the money. Sure. Get the money. <laughs> <laughs> That's what we're going to do. So what I'd like to do is just uh, give you some ideas that uh, we're looking at to get the funding. And one way within the context of an employer's existing budget is they have expenses to solicit, hire, evaluate, and train employees. So we're going to get them to start making sure that they, they know what their hire costs are. I'm sure most of them do, but I found that several haven't updated it. So that's potentially money that could be available to put more emphasis on families, which is what we are going to, it's going to be a theme. You have to support families because it is the building block of our culture, our society. It's a huge deal. So um, this is kind of something I'm exploring so that we can communicate to an employer how this would work. Where, first of all, all of us have to have the compassion to want to help both the parents and the kids. So that's kind of what this is, and this is different steps. Because the ultimate goal is to increase the capacity of the supply side of child care like Tammy and Debbie and their facility and you know maybe expand their facility or maybe build more. So um, one of the other things that's really important I believe is when you talk about child care we have to talk about health and health encompasses not only the kids, but their families. And we have to um, get everyone to see that this is something that has to take place so that these people um, can get paid a living wage. And why this potentially will work, um, families can be great employees. You know, they have uh, obviously the discipline, more discipline I would suggest than a single person. Having been a single person for a while, I think I remember those days. So we really want to um, put emphasis on the family and get them to be thinking of how, as a company, if they are family-centric, then they could potentially open the door to all kinds of new candidates. Because we can't have it in any economy where employees with children can't get a job because it's too expensive to take care of their kids. So we're gonna get that fixed. And we're gonna look at employers, and we're gonna look at health, and look at who is involved in promoting and providing health. It's your healthcare systems, it's the insurance companies, it's the pharmaceutical companies, and it's the medical equipment manufacturers. This is a whole group that has such economic clout. They've gone from 4% 
of our gross domestic product to 23%. So we're going to be looking to them to spend some of their money away from reactive health care and have them spend it on prevention. And prevention pains, we all know that. But it's hard for prevention to be promoted and integrated in an employer because from the healthcare system point of view and the drug companies, there's no money. So it's up to us to convince the employer that, hey, you're buying health. You don't want just insurance. You want health. You want to get to the point where when an employee in his family goes in to see the primary care provider, they are actually being given training on potential opportunities to improve their lifestyle. Maybe it's hiking. Introduce to each person what works for them to exercise, eat better, and that's what we have to do. Because there's a lot of money there. And you know, I've talked to a few of them and I think I'm getting through it to them. So that's my pitch. Well good, all right. Any other last questions? All right, well, again, we're going to utilize this and we'll be keeping this in front of you know, county and um, uh, municipal leaders, business leaders, and uh, hopefully we can help, help make a, a dent and an impact. But appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you.